Um, very glad to have you here. My name is Serene Saade. I am a uh, member of the FLC. I'm SJCO faculty and a Prescott College grad um, and current student. And I'm very, very excited to be moderating today's event uh, with Matthew Brown, who is faculty at Advent in the um, Adventure Education at Prescott College and, um, and said that he, he moonlights in the Environmental Studies program. Um, uh, Matthew is a doctoral candidate in sustainability education, and he's been teaching at Prescott for 13 years. Uh, when we asked Matthew um, to present at today's uh, faculty, um, meet the faculty event, he said that he was excited to share the opportunity for all participants to get a bigger view, a nationwide perspective on what's happening in higher education and in, you know, especially what's related to field studies. So very excited to have uh, Matthew here. Uh, Matthew's presentation is called A Snapshot of Field Education at Institutions Across the Nation. Um, I will leave it to him to, in a minute to kind of describe all that that is, um, since I'm sure I can't do it justice. Uh, but just a couple of quick housekeeping notes before we jump in. This presentation um, will go for, you know, the first segment and then we'll have about 30 minutes of Q&A at the end. If you have any questions um, uh, for Q&A specifically for faculty members and, and press college staff. So if you're not um, a faculty member at the end, we would ask when Q&A starts for you to, you know, head on out, but everybody else, you're welcome to stay. Um, if you've got any questions that come up about uh, the topic at hand, please send them in the chat. I'll be saving uh, those questions and who asks them to a document so we can make sure to get those out. And just super excited to throw it over to Matthew for his presentation. Yeah, thanks so much, Siren. Thanks for moderating today. And thank you so much for everyone who's in attendance. And in addition to that, much thanks also to Gretchen Gano for uh, helping school me a little bit in this process today. Uh, one thing Gretchen did mention is that uh, the goal today was a little bit of uh, sharing some of the things I'm involved with as an educator. Uh, but also I wanted to create a presentation that would have some, some relevance to really our work at Prescott College. And one thing that I've discovered through some of the work you're going to hear about is just sort of how we fit into uh, the greater place in the nation in terms of field education. And much of this presentation is also about a National Science Foundation grant uh, that I'm a co-principal investigator with. And so I think with that, let me share my screen and we'll get started. Okay, uh, so the the official title of this and the, the uh, marketing piece might have been a little bit misleading, but it's really about the River Field Studies Network grant. Uh, and I want to make this a story about uh, a collaborative group of educators and really try to walk you through a little bit of uh, the story of how this grant came to be and what this grant is. Uh, so again, uh, I'm going to go through just sort of like our roadmap. And this is a bit about how this project originated. And then in particular, it's a, about the researchers collaborative network in, in undergraduate biological education with National Science Foundation. So I'll walk you through the grant as well and what the grant does and what we're working on as a team. And then uh, I wanted to provide and really emphasize some of the lessons learned through this process, uh, in part, maybe a little bit of where National Science Foundation is as an institution, some of the things they seem to be funding and some of the surprises we had in working with them recently. And then also just generally the benefits of these various networks that are out there and available to us as educators and as scholars. Uh, so the story, of this grant really goes back all the way to the fall of 2018. And uh, I'm gonna intertwine a number of things that uh, happened. And one of the things that was unique is in the fall of 2018, I attended a conference, a symposium uh, with the Group Management Society. And I'm not sure, I imagine many of you belong to some sort of formal 
organized network or working group or organization. And this group in particular is one that's really focused on rivers and it's a river managers group. So it involves mostly people from the forest service, fish and wildlife service, water departments across the nation, all sorts of folks who work with rivers. And I am part of this organization really as part of like a prior life uh, when I worked as a recreation specialist and uh, recreation planner with Grand Canyon National Park. Uh, but if you look sort of down here, part of River Management Society is as uh, they have a hold of space for educators and with education. And one of those pieces is the River Studies and Leadership Certificate. So at this conference, there happened to be a number of other educators who are the representatives of this certificate program. Uh, Dr. Joel Barnes, who was here at Prescott College, along with Rachel Peters, former field operations director, they were instrumental in the development of the certificate program. And we currently offer the certificate program at Prescott College. And it's an amazing venue for someone who basically wants to achieve maybe a breadth or something equivalent in river management and river studies. So, in the fall of 2018, uh, a professor from VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University, invited a number of the educators who head these different programs to just meet in the lobby and chat for a little bit. We, and finally give us the chance to meet in person after literally probably meeting on the phone and over venues like Zoom for about two to three years. Uh, and again, here's just a little bit more about that River Studies and Leadership Certificate Program. There are currently 13 schools that offer the certificate program, and Prescott College is one of those. And so this group of basically uh, the representatives of this program at various universities got together and chatted. And uh, James Varnish, who is the project team lead for now this National Science Foundation grant, basically pulled the room and said, hey, I've been thinking about submitting a small grant, an incubator grant for people who are interested in river-based field studies. And of that group of about nine people who were there, uh, four or five of us said, yeah, we might be interested in being involved in something like that. Uh, and so currently our project team consists of uh, the principal investigator, James Bonish at Virginia Commonwealth University, Andy Roast at Sierra Nevada University, Danielle Perry, who's just up in Flagstaff, not far here from Prescott at Northern Arizona University, uh, Sarah Yarnell at UC Davis, and John McLaughlin at Western Washington University. Interestingly enough, not all of this team were folks who were involved with that River Studies Leadership Certificate Program, but in a couple of cases, they were colleagues of folks who were at that first and initial meeting. Uh, so lo and behold, we put in this incubator grant, uh, which is a one-year grant, and that one-year cycle is really there to help people fund small projects and meetings to basically put forward a full river-based or undergraduate biological education network grant. And what the network grants are, I didn't know about these, but these network grants are really to form collaborative processes or learning groups amongst educators who specialize in various fields. So our goals for this incubator grant were really to uh, start to develop a network of people who were interested in using rivers as ways for undergraduates to learn. Uh, we planned three in-person meetings as part of the grant. And the goal was also to develop some sort of national river field study so that we could find out what universities across the nation are actually participating in this sort of field work. And then from that, publish a paper based on the results. Uh, and then finally, of course, we want to develop that full network grant application. Uh, so interestingly enough, we had three in-person meetings planned. Uh, the goal partially from some of those meetings to really recruit people who wanted to be part of this network. We got one instead of three uh, because of COVID, but it turns out this very first meeting in Coloma was pretty instrumental to the formation of our network because at this meeting, we were able to, to meet in person to really, I think, form some collaborative goals and to really bond a little bit over bringing students in the field. I think everyone who was involved with our first meeting 
really started to understand some of the benefits and really believed in the benefits of immersing students in some of these outdoor scientific and interdisciplinary learning environments. And they'd seen them firsthand. And furthermore, they really experienced them themselves as undergraduate students, went on to be professors and wanted to facilitate that sort of learning simply because they believed in it so much for their current students. So we met at Camp Lotus along the American River, Coloma, California, and had our first meeting there. And again, turned out to be the only one we had. Uh, but from this, and thanks to the technology we have today, we were able to collaborate quite easily on the full-blown uh, proposal for the network grant. And uh, you know, the interesting thing about this grant proposal and developing is, is we tried to use a number of diagrams, a number of photos to really show what field education was, and also a number of studies that supported field-based education. We ended up with over 170 citations in the proposal of papers and studies that related back to educational benefits of bringing students out into the field. So eventually, uh, we formed the Riverfield Studies Network. And this network, uh, we really defined Riverfield Studies, pardon me, as, uh, as anything from just like a one hour workshop along the bank of a river to a half day, maybe data collecting opportunity for students to a multi week river expedition or a full blown river field course, some of which last uh, in the realm of even up to two to three months. But we were interested in anyone that had anything to do with rivers that wanted to get students out there, whether it was along the bank of the river to tidal pools associated with rivers, or even on rivers themselves in the form of rafting, kayaking, canoeing, or anything along those lines. Uh, we based the whole network around this philosophy of a community of practice. Uh, which was really this idea of, you know, a group of people who cared about rivers who in fact practice in it, in this case, in some cases, both as scientists and researchers, but also educators. And then we were ultimately interested in uh, the educational tools of helping to preserve rivers. Um, so yeah, what do we care about? We really care about ultimately enhancing undergraduate student experiences and outcomes through also supporting healthy rivers and communities that depend on those rivers. And one of the reasons we felt that rivers was a really good meeting point for this network is that rivers are interdisciplinary. They literally are the arteries of our landscapes and the arteries of our world. Communities depend on rivers for everything from food to fresh water to hydrologic power, uh, but also rivers are really a threatened resource currently. And so rivers are also the situation that, especially as we look at climate change, drought in the Southwest, and just changes in climate as a whole with growing populations, uh, rivers are both ecologically at risk, but also the communities that depend on them are at risk as well. And then the field studies component. Uh, I mentioned that the people in that group had experiences in their early college lives or in their early education where rivers stuck to them. And maybe rivers spoke to them very informally as kids. Maybe they had a uh, research experience later on in life. Maybe they had some sort of recreational experience on rivers. But we really found that in this case, river-based field studies enhanced learning that when students were immersed in some sort of field environment, uh, that a lot of things happened. It helped narrow achievement gaps for all demographics. It helped create, I think, a stronger identity of people seeing themselves as researchers and scientists and as community activists of people who could really go out and work with the community, work with rivers to both preserve that river and the community itself. Um, again, with these field studies, one of the things we noticed is that uh, even small field studies had really large impacts, but in particular, 
immersive field studies had very, very large impacts. And some of those factors were really interesting too. They, they weren't just little things about like people knowing more about rivers, but people in basic field courses had opportunities for increased social belongings, feelings of membership, and then also increased skill sets that help them uh, really synergize themselves and other people. But as educators, uh, we also began as the network developed to meet with a lot of people who are really challenged by offering a field component in classes or offering an immersive river-based field course. And in a lot of cases that came down to just simply resources like instructor time and availability being torn by so many other things such as research and work obligations, family obligations. Uh, we also noticed that people needed to have some sort of early interest in rivers. So some sort of prior exposure or a peer that brought them and introduced them into rivers. Uh, and then also field studies are resource intensive. Uh, they sometimes require scientific equipment. They sometimes require van tra transportation. Not every campus has a river or a creek or a watershed that you can just walk down to and use as a teaching resource. And then finally, there were also just risk management aspects with field studies that were really challenging to a lot of instructors and faculty members across the country. Everything dealing with uh, the emergency training that may, they might need to the potential for drug and alcohol use on a course to simply sometimes the very intense interpersonal interactions that are a part of field studies. So with those challenges in mind, uh, we went on to de develop the proposal. And as part of the proposal, we developed the idea of an annual work cycle. This is sort of a messy graphic that gets at this. But the general concept is that uh, there are five different layers of participants. Uh, there is at the very outer ring that the end user, who may or may not be part of the network in the end. Uh, but then there's a mentoring network and a focal cohort. There are committees that are involved in basically spreading and helping share and increase resources based on how to lead field-based courses. And, uh, and finally, there's the steering committees. And throughout this annual cycle, in the winter, we're in process of holding and getting ready for We brought had to develop a deeper lesson or maybe develop a full-blown course using some sort of field-based ped pedagogy. Um, so we work and mentor with those folks throughout the spring. And eventually in the summer, we hold the River Rendezvous. And the River Rendezvous is an in-person meeting of about two dozen people with a number of committee leaders, and also folks who might be somewhat new to field studies. And we really work on training. So ultimately, the full grant was for a five-year work cycle. Uh, and again, this is just a little bit of a, a simple throughout the season, each season. We've developed a plan to try to create regional interest in each one of the river rendezvous. So we'll be moving to five parts of the country as we we learn 
during the studies going to be brought the network was only hold that initial meeting in Coloma in person, but we also developed a survey, which we sent out through all sorts of professional organizations, uh, through peer groups, through different institutional emails, asking various educators if they had ever held any sort of river-based field course or used rivers in any of their teaching in a hands-on way. We ended up with over 150 entries from various people across the country who either were working on rivers or wanted to. Of those, about 30% were groups of people who really wanted to do something with rivers, but they didn't feel like they had the resources or the skill set yet to do it. And about the other two thirds or so were folks who were already involved in river based field studies, in some cases, some very em immersive types of experiences. Uh, but you can see the map there on the right that highlights the different universities and also the different river segments that people are working with. Uh, we've also developed a website at this point that really serves as like our holding place for various lessons, for information sharing, for network contacts. Uh, you can learn more about the just River Studies group there. You can become a member in the network uh, and you can be exposed to a huge variety of resources, everything from academic papers about the pedagogy of teaching in the field to resources that are very lesson specific. Uh, we use the QUBS website and platform as a place to store lessons and to share information about lessons. And many of those lessons also have national databases for scientific data and input that educators from all across the country can contribute to. And so it makes for really active field studies because students are in the field collecting data and then inputting it into these databases analyzing it and getting a really broad base of information. This is just one of the funner pieces of the website right here. Uh, this website or this part of the website basically highlights all the various institutions that are doing river-based work and the river sections that they're also working on as well. So here down in Virginia, we have Virginia Commonwealth University. They offer courses that work with the James River, uh, the Salmon River all the way over in Idaho and also the James River very specifically through Richmond, Virginia, uh, which is much, which is a very urban river. And then uh, they have a number of different studies going on, everything from their scenic viewshed analysis study to uh, flood models for rock pools. And here you see that national database again, and you can click on some of the resources within this map and get little pieces like information on the James River or lesson plans dealing with a specific river from all across the country. Uh, the web portal, the River Studies, River Field Studies website is really like our hub for information holding. So it does everything from profile instructors uh, who might be able to help facilitate some sort of safety meeting or a safety training dealing with rivers to do all sorts of lesson content to materials for recruitment and also applications for the river rendezvous. Uh, and then finally, you know, one piece that ended up uh, being really important for our growth in the incubator process and I think also some of our success with the final grant was that uh, we placed a lot of emphasis on really evaluating our progress and our process as a group and uh, through the use of a partnership with uh, Rupa Gupta uh, of Knowledge and some of the things that she has worked on there. So I think highlighting some of the lessons learned uh, through this process. So we submitted the incubator grant and we're pretty surprised when it was selected uh, in its first round. It had a number of hiccups because of COVID. That's typically a one year grant cycle, but we ended up extending that grant cycle for almost two and a half years because of the delays related to COVID. Uh, and then during that process, finally in let's see, January of 2021, we submitted the full network grant proposal. 
And it, it turned out we got those results back and were awarded the grant, uh, much to a number of our teammates' surprise. But it ended up being the highest scored grant application in the 2021 cycle for these network grants. Uh, some things that we learned that were really interesting in the process, I think if anything, COVID gave us a little bit of an upper hand in the process because it sort of extended the amount of time we had to prepare for our grant application. And we really looked at and met with other people who had successful grant applications. We spent a long time meeting with National Science Foundation and some of their evaluators so we could begin to look at you know, what metrics they were most interested in. Uh, but some of our big takeaways in the process was that National Science Foundation is extremely interested right now in the undergraduate experience and in particular experiences that really begin to, I think, create attachment for students with various disciplines or, or subject matters. And whether that's rivers or something completely different, they see those experiences as being very formative based on a lot of the evidence from research that's currently in the field. Uh, the other thing we placed a very high emphasis on during this process was cultivating relationships and representation from typically and traditionally underrepresented students. And National Science Foundation, thank goodness, is really seeing that as a priority now, where in the past, I would say it's been a little bit less so. Uh, and then finally, the really strong emphasis that we had on field safety with uh, this type of education and also just participant belonging was a big part of our grant and looked very highly upon by the evaluators. And, and then also I mentioned the assessment piece of just really being, being able to figure out the impact that we're having through the creation of this network and the resources and trainings that we're providing. And then uh, finally, I, I think I wanted to just give a little bit of a pitch to our community as, as educators and practitioners of trying to be involved in some of these various academic networks. You know, I mentioned that this whole grant process and network, which I've now been involved with for over three years, you know, started at a small, more traditional meeting gathering, very informally of college-based educators. Uh, but through that, it's grown into membership in a very involved network that's really helping to lift field education at institutions across the country. And one of the things that I found incredibly valuable throughout this process was just being able to have the communication with other educators about what they're doing in their classes and about what they're seeing as really strong field components of field-based education, what that looks like and how they're going about doing it. It's also been incredibly important to not only share resources, whether that's a lesson or a study idea, but just hearing about what's happening at other universities and the challenges other faculty members are facing. And sometimes the mechanisms and strategies they've used to overcome those challenges has been incredibly valuable. Uh, the other thing that's just been remarkable with this is I think the amount of assistance people are willing to provide in terms of feedback on curriculum design and overall program delivery and development and lessons. And the amount of sharing that's come out of it, I think has really significantly lifted the quality of everyone's courses who are involved in the network. And then finally, in the end, it's just been a really amazing opportunity for student activities for them to partner potentially in other research projects that are going on across the country and to really increase like their overall positive experience in these types of studies and in the field of education in general. Uh, and then finally, I, I think the other piece of the network that's been really important is it's not just an educator to educator network, but it is also a, a partnership based in network to network or organization to organization. So for instance, some of our partners within the River Studies Field Network include uh, this UFERN group, which is another National Science Foundation network that's basically uh, a network of 
field stations across the nation and some of the products that they've been able to deliver about different aspects of quality, high quality field-based education has been amazing. Uh, the Emerge program from the, uh, the Society of Freshwater Science, SFS, has been incredible to work with. Uh, we've also been able to develop some really cool trainings for scientists based around rivers uh, that are unique. You know, not everyone needs to know how to run a boat on a river. Uh, sometimes just learning about the precautions that can be beneficial to safety about doing research along the sides or streams of a river or working with communities that depend on a river from a more social science aspect has been really significant. And, and I think the final thing I'd mention is that you know, although this grant program is funded through National Science Foundation, although it does have an emphasis on biological studies, it's what we've discovered as a team is that it's really impossible to create those sort of silos around rivers, that we have people in our network now that range in everything from their primary disciplinary study of being uh, anthropologists all the way to water engineers. And that because of the natural interdisciplinary aspect of rivers, uh, we've all been able to grow quite significantly from one another. And I think also partner on some studies that are going to be pretty impactful down the road. So uh, that's just the general overview of the River Studies Field Network and this process that I've been engaged with for the last oh, three and a half years now. I am very pleased and happy to announce that we ran our pilot River Rendezvous this fall, uh, just a couple weeks ago up on the Rogue River, and we had 24 attendees and just a significantly, incredibly talented group of people uh, from a very, very diverse aspects, and that the, the experience overall was amazingly powerful and, and very impactful for all who were there. And, uh, and thanks, that's uh, the brief overview and happy to take questions or just chat a little bit more about the project. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. That was super informative. Um, so for all of you who are Prescott College faculty, you are welcome to stay in the room, um, faculty staff, but if you are not, um, uh, faculty and, or staff at Prescott College, we would ask for you to leave. We are trying to also use parts of these for some sort of kind of community building within the internal network for the Q&A. So, um, so grateful for all of you. If you are um, in, the, in the room and you have any questions, please send them our way. You can put them in the chat. And there's actually the first question from, uh, from Julie. How can we as an institution um, how can we highlight the certificate opportunity and its value? Yeah, can I just add, Matthew, can I just add real quick? Of course. Thank you for your presentation. And, um, you know, it's sort of embarrassing to just know that this is a part of what we can offer. And as you framed it as a breath, you know, it's like, oh, I've never advised anybody down that particular path. So I feel like I need to kind of just be up to speed more, but I wondered how um, effectively we're marketing it really is what I kind of meant by my question. And, and can we, how do we leverage it and, and use it as a draw and how do we highlight it and its value to um, prospective students? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, Julie. Um, I, I'm gonna answer that more in depth, but one thing I did wanna mention about this river studies uh, group that I am part of right now. The, the five co-PIs and the PI of the project, all of us have in some ways pretty unique backgrounds that you wouldn't really see too often from an educator group that I think allowed a, that group in particular to be able to provide some of the experiences that, that they've been able to do. And I, I think our goal in it was just this understanding and just a huge acknowledgement that not everyone had the access to the same path we were able to take or even on the same path. Um, and because of that path, we were able to, you know, I think pretty comfortably be able to offer field-based experiences. 
And so we were really looking at ways where it was like, well, if people were on a different path or if they weren't introduced to rivers in the same way, how do we introduce them to this? How do we increase their opportunity as educators to just really lift the potential immersive experience in rivers in river studies? And, and I think along those lines, uh, the river studies leadership certificate that uh, river management society provides, and we are part of at Prescott College, is a great opportunity, I think, for any students you find that are interested in like river management and uh, working with rivers from any sort of aspect of water base or recreation piece. And I try to send out an email about once a year to students recruiting from it, but I do a lot of like personal recruitment uh, from time to time with that program. I think the one thing I would share with you all as the instructors and faculty and teachers who are out there working with the students is that there is an amazing job pipeline that's completely available through that certificate program. Uh, I've only had three students here at Prescott College who have finished the program and gone all the way with it, but they've all been able to land pretty coveted jobs doing things that they're really passionate about. And so it's a really amazing opportunity to get people in the job market, not just seasonally, but uh, in the end with like long-term secure employment positions. So, and as far as how it's being marketed, yeah. uh, it's a lot of, lot of word of mouth. You know, it's a lot of, if you like river studies, come say hi. Yeah, thanks. It seems worth highlighting and that we could be more proactive about that. So put it on the list. <laughs> Thank you for that question, Julie, and that answer. Another question, um, what is your perception of how river recreation, perhaps from an economics point of view, um, how are they valued among the river studies network specifically and more broadly, how do you feel river-based recreation is valued in the scientific community? And I will send that question to you in the chat as well since it's quite a long one. <laughs> Thanks, Siren. Um... I think that there is probably stronger crossover between the recreation, scientific, and even uh, like uh, resource-based, like just thinking about water as, uh, as a human resource than in a lot of fields. I have been shocked uh, at meeting how many people, at meeting so many people that maybe do things on rivers recreationally, uh, but also come at it from either a very scientific or a very community-based approach. And certainly not all of that is the river recreation we might think of as you know, being a river rafter or a kayaker or thinking about a boat full of tourists headed down the river. Uh, a lot of it is also just simple things like walking along the river, dog walking along the river, uh, wading in rivers, playing in rivers, tubing in rivers, angling in rivers, all of those little pieces as well. And what I've found is that I think this group has a pretty high awareness of the multitude of ways and the people involved in the network of the multitude of ways that rivers serve both our ecosystems and our human ecosystems in the end. And even folks, you know, we've had a number of people, for instance, on our, our river rendezvous that we held up on the road who we had a couple of participants that had never been camping before outside, for instance. But their knowledge of rivers and what they do ecologically or for communities or for human populations was pretty strong. And I think that they were also really see rivers as serving just a multitude of, of of services, really providing a multitude of services, whether it's economically through, you know, tourism-based recreation, or if it's even uh, just from a therapeutic standpoint of rivers, so. Thank you for that answer. Another question, it's in the chat from Diana. The community of practice component of your project is inspiring. How effective has the community of practice been in crowdsourcing these lessons and activities? Are the training workshops needed periodically to keep the community developing these materials to um, support education? Yeah, I think that for me, that community of practice piece, where I 
I share your sentiments on that. For me, that was just such a wonderful way to think about the work that we do as educators, no matter uh, what we're interested in. And one thing I've noticed is that uh, both the, the Zoom meetings we've had have been fairly effective ways of keeping people hooked in, but it's really those in-person workshops that create the stronger relational bonds from with educator to educator or organizational director to scientist. Uh, those seem to be the pieces that seem to be the strongest because once folks have an opportunity to know one another personally and to have some sort of shared experience together, they're so much more likely to contribute as a committee member, or they're so much more likely to place one of these, you know, crowd or input or upload a crowd-based resource lesson. Uh, and so as a network, we have not underestimated the affective potential of those in-person pieces. And I think we know that to keep the network going, that to keep the network really positive and keep people hooked in, we've got to have those in-person opportunities for people to meet, especially when it's meeting with people who maybe have very diverse backgrounds or diverse experiences or diverse perspectives on rivers. Thank you so much for that. Um, Zoe Hammer would love to know more about the urban river studies. Can you share some examples of approaches to immersive urban river studies? Um, she mentions in LA that they engage with ecosystem rec uh, restoration projects that include the restoration of 11 miles of the Los Angeles River. Ooh, I love that Los Angeles River story. That just uh, makes me so excited. I, so one of the things is that uh, most of these universities across the nation are, are located in, in pretty urban areas and in, in a lot of cases, large cities. And so the urban component of it has been strong as has more of a rural component as well. And there have been ways of engaging students in these different aspects from, you know, water quality studies and looking at nitrogen levels in rivers and, you know, fertilizer offputs to then I think some community action research pieces about uh, you know, organic farming practices and how do we stem chemicals and fertilizers from entering waterways in such a significant way. So I would say that most of the research that's going on out there is probably almost set a little bit more in those urban environments. Um, you know, James Vonish, for instance, he's teaching a course that's, uh, it meets weekly, uh, and during that week-long class, they just spend an hour along the James River, and they start with the basic geography of the river, they move to a little bit of the hydrology, and then they start looking at these really curious tidal pools that are in the estuary of the river, um, and, and then they look in the end about like how the river feeds the community both economically, therapeutically, socially. Thank you. Um, I very much appreciate your response there. I'm I'm not seeing other questions in the chat, so please. Oh, Gretchen, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I'm glad I actually got to join a little bit um, earlier than I thought, but I did miss the beginning of your talk. There's two things that I'm curious to know a little bit more about. One is what are some of the lessons you're learning about bringing in underrepresented students? And you know what's the role of individual network, you know, institutions versus something that you're doing, you know, network wide. And then the second thing is now that you are, you have this network, um, and you're building trust. Um, what are the opportunities to create some research projects that are pan network? potential. Yeah. So those are two kind of different, but bigger, big questions. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> those are excellent. I, okay, so I, I would say from our like inclusion, inclusion, belonging, recruiting, which we've done a, quite a bit of from underrepresented underrepresented groups, that's been such a huge focus of our work. And, you know, that's been in a number of ways. Uh, some of that's been in race and ethnicity, but also certainly gender and sexual orientation and 
also looking at aspects of uh, able-bodiedness in terms of just who can participate in these various things. And I think one thing that's been really powerful is we've been able to share so many perspectives on that recently in terms of whether it's coming from a student perspective or an instructor perspective, uh, that it's really, it's, I think, broadened everyone's knowledge to, I think, to, to getting to this point where um, I, it's almost each individual and in each situation deserves its own sort of approach that there is so much diversity out there and so many different perspectives that that's been uh, something that, you know, we, there is certainly no we, one formula for recruiting because of that, or there's no one formal way of going about inclusion because of that. So I think that's been the most interesting thing that we've learned. And one of the processes of our, of our, both our uh, online rendezvous or winter gathering and then as well as the in-person pieces uh, that that has been I think a stronger sort of aspect of it is uh, just hearing from everyone's perspective personally about how they got there and why they got there and what interests them. So that's that piece. Uh, can you repeat your second question, Gretchen? It may be here in the chat, yeah. but I might have lost it. It was not, it was not fair. They were totally different. Well, so the other one was, I mean, so I also have been a part of a, a lot a longer term research network before. And one of the exciting things that I think you might be experiencing is that once you all get to know each other, there's a kind of people get emboldened to try things that they wouldn't otherwise try. Um, as an individual institution. And sometimes some of the disciplinary things that were keeping people apart started to fall away. And I'm curious now that you have you have some more years to go, where what the opportunities for creating new research together look like for the network. Yeah, I think you're so on the mark, Gretchen. I think as these relationships grow and there's more trust, people are willing to experiment a little bit more or cross-discipline view things stronger. And one piece that's emerged already is uh, we have a study going uh, that is just starting to roll in the process of basically looking at student outcomes in field-based courses that are related more so to identity and belonging and self-efficacy and and safety and that's been a that's just starting to we're just starting to get the ball rolling on this project but i think that study there is something that emerged because of that trust from one another just knowing that people had strong skill sets in certain areas that could be blended together well and realizing that we were all very interested in trying to discover, you know, what are some of the results from immersive field-based studies on those things that are a little bit more of the like affective side of the field, the in relationship to uh, to field safety. Thank you, Gretchen, for that question, and Matthew for your answer, Robin. Yeah, thank you. This is so fun to learn about everything that you've been up to. <laughs> so one of, one of the things um, I was poking around in, uh, and learning and I was looking at the course lists around the uh, certificate um, and I noticed that there seems to be a mix of undergraduate and graduate courses. Was there any, um, um, is there a deliberate targeting of, um, is it, of an undergraduate level versus a graduate level? Yeah, I think the way it works is very interesting is that, uh, so each school that's involved in the certificate program basically proposes classes that, uh, so to speak, sort of, uh, check a box in a certain area. And one of the things that's out there is that uh, some of the institutions that are in the certificate program work a lot with graduate students and have a lot of graduate students. So they might have undergraduate and graduate classes that could check a certain box in the certificate area. 
So those graduate courses are really reserved for people working in those programs that have a lot of grad students. Um, but in the end, the certificate is the same, whether you're an undergrad or a master's student. Yeah, well, so then I guess I have I have an invitation. <laughs> an invitation might be, I don't know if there's um, opportunities to integrate, but I just noticed that we actually do have a lot of graduate level courses that parallel some of the ones in the Prescott College list. So like ConBio, for example, we also offer at the graduate level. And I just wonder if that might open doors for more participation from um, folks who are um, coming back to school a lot. Um, and might be really interested in applying what they're learning to river studies. Yeah, I think that's brilliant, Robin. Uh, I think that there probably is some really cool opportunities for our graduate students that might be within that river certificate program uh, that we're not reaching right now. So I'm so glad that you thought about that, and I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on it, and maybe we can meet up about it. Yay. Oh, count yeah. on it. I'll yeah, start really sending neat. you emails. Yeah, cool. No, it's just so neat. Um, and then I have another question. And this is um, wondering, um, no reason why this would happen, but wondering if, uh, if there are counterpart networks um, internationally, you know, I, I know, so this is a selfish question, you know, being um, doing my own research in Central Asia, um, I, I don't remember bumping into any any of this, and I try to keep track of all all sciencey people hanging out in the region. And I just wondered, maybe I, I just wasn't aware, and I would I would love to be aware. Yeah, I I think one thing that's a little bit uh, that, that I wish existed that I haven't been able to see yet is you know there's a a number of these network grants out there. They've been ongoing for about uh, seven to eight years now. Some of the grant cycles have ended. The groups have felt like, well, we serve the purpose of the grant and our network. And the network has sort of dissolved and disbanded. In other cases, the, the network has decided to uh, continue, often in the form of like a nonprofit organization, which I think is something that we're hoping to do with this Rivers Network. Yeah, we wanna keep it rolling and sustain it beyond the grant cycle. And, one thing I wish that existed was I wish NSF had a list and link to all of these different networks that exist. Because for instance, one of the things I'm thinking of Robin is one of the grants we looked at uh, that was very successful was this awesome agroecology network that's out there that might just you know, don't maybe you're a member already or part of it, but if not, it would be such a great fit for you. And so I sort of wish that there were opportunities or a clearinghouse, so to speak, where these different networks were listed uh, because that agricultural grant was just awesome and the group and the people in it just seemed really spectacular. Yeah, neat. Thank you. Thank you for that. That was wonderful. Um, uh, please remember to put your questions in the chat or raise your hand or just, you know, start speaking and let us know what your questions are. But while we're waiting for additional questions, Matthew, I would love to know um, some of the sort of network best practices that you might recommend. Yeah, I one thing that's interesting, so we're very early in our grant. In fact, we ran this pilot river rendezvous really off budget money that we had in our incubator grant. And we, we barely even touched or began to start our, our grant cycle. Um, but one of the things I've seen as a resource that I just felt was really fantastic was one of the parallel networks that's out there, which is uh, UFERN. And they're basically field educators, researchers network. And UFERN is really, they're sort of the, the folks who are involved in field stations like Keno Bay, for instance, uh, you know, being like a field station at Prescott. And they came out with a couple of best practices resources that I was really impressed with that had to do with field-based education. So one of them dealt with uh, sort of inclusion and belonging pieces. And the other one was more just general pedagogical aspects or pieces and their two resource lists they're absolutely incredible uh, if i was more savvy i would be able to 
like continue this Zoom meeting and then at the same time put their resources or their website into the chat. But if you Google UFERN, as in U dash F E R N, and website, you can pull up their website and those resources are on there. And so that's one of the things I think that's been really beneficial so far from a partnership aspect is uh, it's much easier to hear about or know about some of these other things that are out there. And they put a lot of work into those resources and I was very impressed with them. Thank you for that. I, I appreciate that um, answer. And I think Gretchen just put the link in the chat. So for all of you who like want to- Like magic. <laughs> Thank you, Gretchen. Thanks, Gretchen. <laughs> I would love to know if there are any other questions. You can put them in the chat. You can start speaking up, but uh, we still have a bit of time left. And I'm, it was a really wonderful presentation. So I'm sure there's a lot of interest and, you know, curiosity. So um matthew one question that just came to me in the chat is you know when you're communicating the work of sort of what's happening in this river project what are what are like some kind of basic tenets for communicating it particularly to people who aren't in um sort of environmental education um environmental sciences adventure education field how would you communicate what's happening to you know people in the social sciences well, okay, I might have to expand or get a, a second rundown on that question so I'm understanding it correctly. Um, so, but I, I think the question is how, how does this group communicate with or reach people who are maybe outside of the standard target audience? Would that be correct? I would assume that's what they mean, yep. Yeah. Yeah, it is interesting. So, so many of the folks that uh, I would say the majority of the people that are currently involved in the network are people who have some sort of science or ecology background. So we're talking PhDs in stream ecology, PhDs in oh, even uh, ecological statistics, hydrology, geomorphology, geology. There's quite a bit of that, but there's also people who I would say are very interdisciplinary educators. And there are also, as I mentioned, some people that are in involved in a little bit more in the social sciences. And I think one thing we're working on is of our five committees, you know, one of our committees is really focused on broadening network participation. And they've been using specific recruitment tools. So say for instance, working with the Society for Freshwater Science Emerge program, which specifically recruits students who are typically underrepresented uh, to try to use those sorts of resources that already exist, that are already out there where people are pretty networked with folks who come from broader backgrounds than just the technical sciences because we want to keep the network interdisciplinary, like beyond just a scientific or traditional biological scope, because rivers themselves are so interdisciplinary. And we really feel like if the network itself, if membership becomes too lopsided or too heavy in one way, it sort of excludes people who might be coming at it from say the social sciences or anthropology or some sort of collaborative um, action sort of perspective. And, and so that's where we really use that whole committee to try to sort of diversify our participatory ship with the hopes that if it doesn't stay lopsided, people will be more likely to become involved. Thank you for that. So um, I believe we're all just faculty now. Um, if you're not faculty, we're going to ask that you leave. We're going to move to sort of the faculty Q&A portion. And uh, we do have a question from Diana as well um, that we'll go to. And it's, you know, this is more of an informal faculty hangout piece. So feel free to speak up, you know, do your thing. We want, we want people to feel really kind of welcome and, and wanting 